I enjoyed that Jesus loves me from the children. I saw Faith back there, she was trying to sing. And John Riddell. So, <laughs> now what, what do we do? Very good, thank you for that. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer. Before we begin, we have uh, uh, some needs to pray about, people to pray for, and uh, some, some who are absent tonight because they're dealing with heavy situations, so we need to, to uh, pray for God's mercy and comfort uh, for these folks and for those who are traveling away from us, pray for God's protection of them, and there's some, uh, many sick, different things going around, and uh, uh, some, uh, some back in the saddle, and some just fell out. So we're, uh, we're praying for a restoration and healing for some of those. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your work in our lives. We thank you for the word that you've given to us that sustains us, and that which gives us comfort through the Holy Spirit when we have difficult times and difficult trials. And we think of some in the body who are going through those things. We think of the days. Uh, we pray that you strengthen them and work in their lives now as uh, Brother Loveless is uh, going through this difficult time in his physical life. We pray your mercy to him and to his wife, Jean. We pray for others uh, in the body and connected with the body going through difficulties right now. We pray your comfort for them and help them to look to you. Pray for those who are traveling and away from us. We pray you strengthen them and protect them and uh, give them uh, a good times of, of uh, a fellowship and encouragement together. We pray for those who are sick in the body of those who are not able to be with us because of this, we pray your strength for them. We pray for the Twombleys, and I pray you strengthen Brother Twombley as he is re recovering still from this uh, bout that he had, and we pray that you give him the strength to get around and the ability to breathe clear. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the word that you've given us again, and that which uh, enables us to grow, that which challenges our thinking and challenges our, our flesh and tells us what we ought to be and then gives us the comfort and the blessing of being obedient and in, in a right order with you. We thank you, Lord, for these things. We thank you for God's people tonight. I thank you for those who are here to worship you in spirit and truth. I pray you bless our time together, and I pray that as we look into your word that you would use it in each heart to bring the need of the moment. We ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to be in 2 Kings 13. 2 Kings 13, and I think this is the second to last uh, sorry, second to last message from the life of Elisha, 2 Kings 13. And we'll start reading in verse 1. In the three and twentieth year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel and Samaria and reigned seventeen years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom, just like his father Jehu. And the angel of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he delivered them into the hand of Hazael, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, all their days. And Jehoahaz besought the Lord, and the Lord hearkened unto him, for he saw the oppression of Israel, because the king of Syria oppressed them. And the Lord gave Israel a savior, so that they went out from under the hand of Assyrians, and the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before time. Nevertheless, they departed not from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who made Israel to sin, but walked therein, and there remained the grove also in Samaria. Neither did he that is God leave of the people to Jehoahaz, but fifty horsemen, ten chariots, and ten thousand footmen, for the king of Syria had destroyed them, and had made them like the dust by threshing. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoahaz and all that he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Jehoahaz slept with his fathers. They buried him in Samaria, and Joash, his son, reigned in his stead. And verse 10, in the 30th and 7th year of Joash, king of Judah, began Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, to reign over Israel and Samaria and reigned 16 years. So we have Joash and Jehoahaz uh, reigning in a the different kingdoms, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jehoash, the son of jo Jehoaz, and Joash, both reigning. Joash, king of Judah, Jehoash, king of Israel, in verse 10. But Jehoash is also called Joash. So it gets very confusing if you don't pay close attention uh, between the two kingdoms. Uh, Joash of Judah and then Jehoash of Israel is also called Joash of Israel. And they reign in overlapping kingdoms, which makes it even more confusing. There are two different kings of two different kingdoms and yet uh, uh, crossed over in time and had uh, relationships as we see here. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, but he walked therein. And the rest of the acts of Joash, that's Jehoash, 
and all that he did and his might wherewith he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the king chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Joash slept with his fathers, and Jeroboam sat upon his throne, and Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died, and Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And so right here we see the context of what's been going on in Israel. Israel has not been, uh, not been serving the Lord in truth or in sincerity or in singleness. They've been serving the Lord and uh, uh, the gods of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, sinning. They had groves in Samaria. They have a lot of sinful things going on. And they call on the Lord to preserve them. He sends them a savior and they're able to get some respite, but they don't deal with these sin issues in the camp, if you will. And so they continue to be challenged and to be oppressed by Syria. And the Lord allowed this. In fact, the Lord brought Syria and the Lord delivered uh, Israel into Syria's hand all the days of Hazael and then Ben-Hadad, his son, the kings of Syria. Why? Because of their disobedience, because of their idolatry, really, before the Lord. And so they struggled. They struggled in their lives as supposedly God's children because of sin in their midst. Can we see a parallel and an application for us today? We struggle with the oppression of the world. We struggle with difficulty. We struggle with trouble in our lives and our perception of these things, mostly because of sin in our lives. And we, don't get rid of, we won't get rid of sin. We don't fully get rid of it. We leave it in Samaria, or we leave the groves over here, or we leave pockets of uh, the worship of uh, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, uh, as jo Joash did. And as Jehoaz did in verse 2, a sad state of affairs, but this is what happens. And this is the life of God's people often. And we have to get past these things. We have to get victorious over these things and spend our seasons, our time serving the Lord and not keep falling into these pits and falling into these tracks of time where we're in captivity, where we're in bondage. And there's a lot of spiritual uh, parallels for us here. But when we come to Elisha's life, we find that he's now close to the end of his life. And I want you to know that from the last recorded miracle of Elisha until now is probably over 30 years. Probably over 30 years. So in the beginning of Elisha's life, he had a lot of, uh, uh, I don't want to say popu popularity, but publicity at least. Publicity. Big, huge events happening. Things that are recorded, things that are miraculous, things that everybody knows about. But then for most of his ministry, actually, we don't know anything about it. There's no word for us about it. He served the Lord in anonymity for those years. Most of our Christian life is going to be anonymity and faithfulness to God. We find that, that Elisha, at the end of his life, though, is still serving the Lord. And he didn't because he's now anonymous, because now his name is not in lights, because now the Lord is not doing these wonderful and great uh, magnificent miracles through him that, oh, now I don't need to serve the Lord as much anymore, or now it's not as important maybe, or maybe now the battle is not as fierce. No, Elisha was faithful to the Lord to the end of his days, and even though the second part of his life and the second part of his ministry was largely silent as far as what we know of it, and it doesn't seem like there was a whole lot of movements of God going on in the, in the land at that time, uh, he was still faithful to the Lord, and I praise God for that, and that's a good testimony for us. It's a good challenge for us that we, no matter what happens in our lives, we think we, sometimes we think, well, I want to be part of something big for the Lord. Well, that's all well and good, but God instructs us to just serve him every day. Just serve him every day. That's what's big in the eyes of God. That's what he wants us to do. Sometimes he'll use us in something that seems to be a momentous thing. Sometimes he'll use us in something that seems to be insignificant, but that doesn't mean that it is. It might appear that way to us, but not according to God's uh, stewardship, not according to God's economy. It's not a small thing. We need to look at things from God's perspective and from God's way. And just like Elisha, we should be faithful to the Lord, even if our ministry before him is in anonymity or we come to a place where we're not in, it's not a big public thing. There's not a whole lot going on. We're just being faithful to the Lord, just plodding along, being faithful to the Lord. And that's what God desires of us. He wants us to just be faithful. The best Christians that I've known are not the Christians who knew the absolute most about the scriptures, which is a great thing to do. Don't let me diminish that, okay? They're, but they're not the people that they're not the people that 
had the biggest name, it had the most popularity and the, the largest ministry or the largest reach. Those are not the best Christians that I've known. The best Christians that I have known, and you would say this too if you really think about it, are the ones that you knew that over time were just faithful to the Lord. They were just faithful from beginning to their, uh, from the beginning of their Christian life to their last breath, they were faithful to the Lord. And you realize, you look at that, and you say, wow, through adversity in their lives, through difficulty, that person was faithful. That is greatness in the eyes of God. Absolute greatness in the eyes of God. Are we going to be like that? Are we, is that going to be able to be said of us when we go to glory and when we breathe our last here and when they put a tombstone uh, where, we, where our body lies? Well, that, that, he was a faithful brother. She was a faithful sister. And they just honored the Lord with their lives. And I, you know, it doesn't matter how many people we, we can uh, pack in an auditorium or how big a conference we can have or, or, uh, or uh, all of these different statistics that we can give that make things seem bigger than they are so often or, or really should be sometimes. Uh, those things don't matter in the eyes of the Lord. Our faithfulness to him, our obedience to him is what matters. Remember, obedience is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Let's obey the Lord. Let's be faithful just like Elisha. Elisha went through all of these miracles with the nation of Israel. Many things that he accomplished miraculously in order to demonstrate to the people, remember, Jehovah is God, and that God had somebody through whom he was going to speak. Here is Elisha, the man of God, and you have him preaching the message of Jehovah and trying to draw the people back into the pure and true and singular worship of Jehovah. And we, we would have to say, if we look at uh, Elisha's life, that largely he failed. Largely he failed. He could not turn the heart of the people. For all of his miracles, he could not turn the people's heart to the Lord. And yet he was faithful to the Lord. And some people's hearts did turn to him. We praise God for that. But Elisha had a long and arduous ministry. Most of his ministry uh, in the second part was dealing with sin, dealing with wicked kings, as we've, as we've uh, gone over the last several messages of the life of Elisha. But the early ones, providing oil for the woman of Shunem, those things are exciting. They're great. Raising the widow's son to life. That's wonderful. That's great. But most of his ministry was spent dealing with the sins of people dealing with the hard things of people. And that's most of our lives going to be also. Our ministry in God's church together is going to be mostly dealing with the sins of people. Every once in a while, we'll see a great thing that we say, wow, this is of the Lord and he's given us a special blessing. Uh, we, we would see it as a miraculous because we know it came, comes from his hand. We say, wow, this is wonderful. But that's the rare thing. The normal thing for us is we're dealing with people, people who come in and out of here, ourselves, uh, sinfulness, things that we need to repent of and grow through, uh, times of change, times of, wow, we need to learn this together from the scriptures and we need to grow and we need to make some changes here, times of repentance, wow, we've sinned here, we need to change here, uh, uh, individual, corporate, all of these things, uh, and trying to help people who come in who are lost. This is normal. That's what every week is, week by week ministry in God's church is. And if we're not faithful there, then it really doesn't matter if we're there for the momentous things. Uh, what is that? I, I think of the miracle of, of, uh, in Acts when Eutychus fell out of the window and he was raised to life. I love that one uh, because uh, that was a Sunday night. Come on. And Sunday night, you had God's people in God's house where they ought to be. And Sunday night, uh, they were in the upper room and it was hot up there. And they had the oil lamps going, so there was a lot of fumes there. And Paul got preaching a little bit too long, which I will not do tonight. And... Uh, and uh, so maybe there were some practical lessons learned, but, but the people learned there, but the people were there, and that's a blessed thing. I don't know if there was anybody who was part of that church who wasn't there on Sunday night. But if they weren't, they sure missed something big, didn't they? They missed a, they missed a man falling out of a window and dying. But bigger than that, they missed his resurrection. They missed him being raised to life. Can you imagine having to be told about that on Monday? Whew. Well, where were you? Uh, I had something else better going on, something else more important. Wow, did you really? Uh, and uh, if you read that passage, it says they were not a little comforted. It means they were really comforted. They were really comforted because of what God did in their lives. It's a great blessing. And uh, so they were there on Sunday night in God's house, but there was no expectation that Eutychus was going to fall out of a window and get raised to life. And by the way, if you fall out of a window here, you're not going to get raised to life. So don't tr that's not, that's not try to make anything happen, okay? Uh, but but they, they were just there to serve the Lord. Now, let's say, on the flip side of that, somebody was there just for that Sunday night, but they weren't there for any other services or for most other services. What does that big event do for them, really? 
Does it really make an impact in their life? No, it didn't, didn't spur them on to faithfulness. It, it didn't help them with their spiritual, spiritual life. They didn't grow from it. They just witnessed a miraculous thing and thought it was great. Ood and odd over it. That's what America, a lot of American Christianity is like. We live for these huge moments. We want to see the big moves, the big works of God, and we see the big works of God, and then nothing changes. And we go right back to the way we were. Well, it's no, no use being part of those big moments if we're not part of the normal moments to which, or to which God calls us and commands us. Uh, all of these moments in Elisha's life as he brought along the sons of the prophets as, and as he dealt with Hazael of Syria back in chapter 8, he, used, he dealt with Jezebel uh, and the house of Ahab. But here in 2 Kings 13, we have him at the end of his life. Verse 14, Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. So you can imagine, here is Elisha basically on his deathbed. He's sick. And he's not doing well, and he knows that this is, I assume that he knows, but even if he doesn't, this is what was happening. He was going to die from this sickness. God says this is a sickness that he had whereof he died. So it was the sickness that killed him, and he had it at this moment. And having physical difficulty right now at this present time in his life, and looking back the last 30 years and realizing what has happened. We're, we've still got a nation that's being oppressed by Syria, and that hasn't turned back to the Lord. Do you think that would have been frustrating to Elisha? It would be frustrating to me. I'd about say I about had enough. Uh, Lord, move me somewhere else or take me home. I don't want to do this anymore. But Elisha is still honoring the Lord. What a great thing. Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Now, I think that jo Joash was well-meaning in this statement. If you'll remember, this is the same statement that's made back in chapter 8. If you go back there, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, that's, 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 that's too far. I want to go on chapter 2. And verse 12, chapter, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 12. This is when Elijah was going across, uh, going up. And they had just crossed the Jordan, and he, Elisha had asked for the double portion of Elijah's spirit. Do you remember that? And Elijah said to Elisha, if, if you see me taken up, then your desire will be granted. And if you don't see me, then nothing will happen. And Elisha saw it, verse 12. He saw the whirlwind, he saw Elisha go up by a whirlwind, and he cried. And what did he say? He said, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And... He saw him no more. He took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And so he was very grieved over the fact that Elijah had gone, although he knew it was happening and he, he was going to miss him. And he recognized that now it is time for me to take up the mantle, which he did, took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. By the way, it's interesting how many colloquialisms come from the scriptures. We often say someone took up somebody's mantle. Where does that come from? this story right here. But anyway, we come back to 2 Kings 13. 2 Kings 13. And we have Joash, who's not honoring the Lord, saying the same thing over Elisha that Elisha said over regarding Elijah. He said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Well, why did he say that? I'm not exactly sure. I, can, I have some speculation, though, which I'll share with you. I think that uh, it, it's one of a couple things, or maybe a mixture of these things, that Joash was worried that their connection to God was leaving, and there didn't seem to be anybody to take up the mantle. Joash was worried about that. They're under oppression from Syria, and now Elisha is sick, and he's, uh, it's apparent that he's going to die, and so he is nervous about this. He's scared by this, and so he basically s makes this statement and I think perhaps suggesting that maybe he would be the one to take Elisha's place. Maybe God will give me the great powers that Elisha has demonstrated in the past, the connection to God so that we will have freedom from the oppression of our enemies, we'll be able to be victorious in battle, all of these things. So I think it's probably a mixture of those things, both fear and grief over the fact that God's, their connection to God was human connection to God was leaving, and perhaps suggesting himself as the opportune one to take up the mantle, but he was not honoring the Lord. So he could not be the one. 
He could not be the one to take up the mantle. But the Lord was still using Elisha. Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. So he's there with the king Joash. Elisha is weakened because of his illness. And he tells Joash to take a bow and arrows. And he took him bow and arrows, uh, which is an interesting thing. Because Israel had, was in a battle against Syria. And Syria representing the oppression of God's enemies. Now, we can make a spiritual parallel for us here, some application for ourselves today. What does he say? What, is he, what, what are good are a bow and arrows unless you take them in your hand? Are they any good? Are they any good at all? Not any good at all. They don't do a thing. And you can express your fear. You can express your anger at the enemy, as Joash no doubt would have. But without the bow in his hand, he could not do anything about it. And Elisha told him, take the bow and arrows. Hold your place there and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. To a very familiar passage. But Ephesians chapter 6. And he says in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. By the way, we stand against. It's okay to stand against things. Sometimes we feel bad about always being against, uh, again things. We need to be against things. This is what the Christian life is. It's a battle. We're always battling against something. God's, how many times does he word, use the word against here? Uh, a bunch of times. We're, we're to be against things. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. What does he say in verse 13? Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Take unto you. What did he say? What did, what did Elisha say to Joash? He said, take unto you bow and arrows. If we're going to use the weapons of God, if the weapons of God are going to be effective for us, we have to take them. We have to get in the battle. We have to be active in the battle. And this is what message Elisha was trying to get across to Joash, we've got to be, you've got to be active here. You can't be passive. You've got to be active. You've got to be rooting out sin and evil, and you've got to be fighting against it, warring against it. We have a law warring in our members individually, don't we? The flesh against the spirit. It, there's a spiritual battle going on. We have a war going on. We should not forget it. There's a battle, and we're in it. We're in it individually, and we're in it together, and we need to take unto us the weapons. Take them in our hands, just like Elisha told Joash, take the bow and arrow in your hands. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the blessed plate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, with, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We have to be willing to take these things to us and get in the battle ourselves. Are we like that? What about the spiritual battle that's in our lives? Are we willing to fight the battle against sin and against uh, doubt, against discouragement, against those things that Satan would bring into our lives, those fleshly tendencies that we have, perhaps anger, perhaps immoral tendencies? What are these things that are in our lives? We're warring against them. And these are the weapons of our warfare, but so often we refuse to take them to us because it requires some activity, and we would like to have a passive Christian life. I would like it to just be easy. I would like it to come to me by osmosis. I would like to grow just because I exist, but not because I position myself in the right, not because I take unto myself the armor of God. I'd like to be victorious just because I am, not because I actually have to fight for something. Not because I actually have to do work in my spiritual life to grow. And God says you need to take these things to your life. Back in 2 Kings chapter 13, Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. Really enforcing this with him. Put thine hand upon the bow. He put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And I think that he maintained that position with his hands on the king's hands, even through the next instruction, 
Verse 17, he said, open the window eastward, and he opened it. And Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, notice that the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou have consumed them. And whether Elisha's hands remained or not is not necessarily important, but the fact that his hands were there was demonstrating the partnership of God with man here. Elisha putting his hands on the bow was demonstrating God will be with you. God is going to help you. And when I say partnership, I don't mean an equal partnership. I mean, I mean a 100% God and we're there <laughs> uh, partnership, okay? Uh, but a willingness to be used by God. And when, one, when we will obey the Lord, God will work with us. By the way, the same is true for us when we do anything for the Lord. When we go out witnessing, God will go with us. Amen. When we have to fight against wrong in our lives, God will go with us. When we have grief in our lives and we have the battle to fight uh, of fear or of discouragement, God will go with us. He, will, he promises that he will never leave us nor forsake us. It wasn't that his promise to Joshua who was about to go fight battles in the land of Canaan. I'll be with you. And the Lord is with us. Jesus Christ told his disciples, he said that the Spirit uh, was with them, and he said he shall be in you. He dwells within us in this day. We have the Holy Spirit within us. He's always with us. We can praise God for this. He says in verse 16, Put thine hand upon the bow, and he put his hand upon it, and Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward, and he opened it. Then, El then Elisha said, Shoot. By the way, eastward was the direction of Syria. He said, Shoot, and he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's de deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. See, the, what he wanted was deliverance from Syria, but Elisha was trying to tell him, you need to depend on the Lord for this. This is the Lord's deliverance. That's why his hands were on the bow with uh, Joe ashes. This is the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. And as you shoot that arrow, it's a picture of something. We're illustrating victory over, we're illustrating victory over Syria. And God, many times in his scriptures, illustrates for us victory over Satan and sin and the flesh in our lives. And it is preached on, it's told this is what will happen if you do so. That's the arrow going forth, demonstrating to us, yes, here's a, a promise from God, if you will. The arrow of the Lord's de deliverance, the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou have consumed them. And notice it, he said in verse 18, take the arrows, and he took them, and he said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. So the way that the man of God, Elisha, told him was basically to uh, smite upon the ground, not just to hit the ground once, but to smite upon the ground. The idea being to uh, keep hitting. So if I said, uh, uh, I was going to uh, punch you in the face, I won't do that. But if I were to say that I was going to do that, you would think of one punch. But if the, the way this is, this is stated, it was the idea of beating. So if I were going to say you got punched or you were struck, you would think of a one, one, uh, one punch, right? But if I said I beat you or smiting you, smiting upon is the way the King James English clues us into this fact that it would be a continual thing. Beat upon the ground. And so Joash, sadly, with his uh, passivity, and with his non-aggressive nature toward that which was coming against him, just took the arrows and went like this. And you can kind of picture him doing it half-heartedly, like, really, do I have to do this? Do I have to hit the ground, e Elisha? And he did it three times. And Elisha, the man of God, verse 19, it says, the man of God was wroth with him. Here he is on his deathbed. He's a sick man. He's sick of the sickness whereof he dies. He's ministered this whole time to these people. They've not responded. Now is an opportunity for God to bring great deliverance. And all it entails is him smiting the ground. And he gives us half-hearted. And Elisha realizes, this guy is not serious. This guy is never going to be victorious. Do you know sometimes when we deal with people, and even when I deal with people as a pastor and they come to me, maybe they got a sin issue in their life. They got a difficulty in their life and they say they want help. Just like Joash did to Elisha saying, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. 
And you try to offer them the word of God and offer them help, and they'll say, okay, maybe. Okay, I'll see. Okay, I'll try. And they won't just commit to obey the scriptures, and they're not willing to really deal with the sin issue that's in their lives. You know what I say about that person, and you do it too when you deal with people. You say, this person's not serious. They're going to stay in the same boat that they were in yesterday because they're not serious about getting rid of this in their lives. What did the Lord Jesus say even about those who would enter the kingdom? He said, you need to, make, uh, he, he said, uh, you need to not, not let your arm or your eye keep you out of the kingdom. We have a very low view of God's kingdom today. We have a low view of the entry into it sometimes. We have a low view of our position in it and what God wants us to do in it. And we don't want to really deal with sin. We don't really want to root it out. We want to just leave it. We just want to leave and do things our way. No, it's, it's something that's serious. It needs to be dealt with. The man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times instead of just three. Then hadst thou smitten Syria till thou hadst consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. Now you're only going to have three victories and they're not gonna, it's not going to be total victory. You could have completely took them out of the picture. But because you have a half-hearted view of this thing, because you're passive, because you won't actively deal with this situation, because you're not aggressive in dealing with this enemy of the Lord, because you're focused on too much on following the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and not focused enough on, on following the Lord, you're not going to have real victory. You're going to have partial victory. And this thing is going to continue to be a burn the saddle. It's going to continue to be that pain in the neck. And if we're not serious about sin in our lives and do anything that it takes to get rid of it, then these things will keep coming back and bugging us. They're going to keep being oppressive in our lives. By the way, you know what? I, I speak to some people who are, uh, who are, I say, I need to stop saying it. I've said in the past, struggling with the sin of, uh, with immorality and perhaps in pornography or something like that. We shouldn't say struggling with it. It's you're just involved in sin. So how do you get not involved in sin? Okay, maybe you have to get rid of some things in your life. Say, well, that makes my life more difficult. So what? What, what is more worth it? Maybe you can't have a cell phone. Maybe you need to get a flip phone. Uh, what, what, what are you doing? You're not serious. You're going to stay in the same boat. Nothing's going to change. You might have, a, you might have a, a, a less of the sin in your life, perhaps, maybe. Probably not, but maybe. But will you get rid of the sin? No, it's going to keep coming back and bothering you. It's going to keep being a problem. Why? Just like Joash. He smite the ground three times. And Elisha said, you should have done it five or six times. Now you're only going to have half a victory. Now you're not going to really, the job's not going to be finished. Elisha died, they buried him, and the bands of Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. More trouble more trouble. This is what happens in our lives. We need to be careful about these things. We need to be uh, diligent about these things. Recognize that sin and Satan are never at rest. We need to be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's seeking to hinder us. He's seeking to sift us as wheat. He's trying to cause problems in our lives. And we get this soft view of sin in our lives. It's like a soft wall against that sin a soft wall against it and its results in our lives. It's like the, uh, it's like the southern border. Uh, it's just porous. And we pretend to care about it. We're going to do something about it. Let's pass a bill. But nobody's serious about it. Right? It's just passive. We, we want to just hit smite in the ground three times. That's all we're doing. We're Joe Ash. That's the way we are spiritually much more severely and seriously. That's where we are spiritually sometimes. What are we going to be like? I pray that we will not be like that. Let's not have the feigned spiritual heart of Joash that gives credence and lip service to God's man or to, in our case, to the Lord and says, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. But when it comes down, down to brass tacks, really time to deal with it, we just smite the ground three times. And let's have the fervent heart of, Eli of Elisha regarding sin. He had the second Corinthians uh, what is it? Second Corinthians 4. I have to look at it.
Well, now I can't find it. But anyway, he talks about how they dealt with the sin that was in their church. Second Corinthians 7. Oh, man, I was way, way off. Thank you. Second Corinthians 7. Oh, yeah, here we go. Verse 11. Uh, verse 10. Uh, Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, yea, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. And all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear of this matter. That was the a attitude of Elisha. Elisha was wroth about this. Let's get rid of this sin. Let's get rid of this apathetic attitude toward the enemies of God. Now, we don't have uh, Syria coming against us like Israel had, but we have Satan coming against us, another big S. And we have the tools, we have the armor, we have the weaponry to defeat him, but we've got to take it, and we've got to be aggressive with it. We've got to be, not be passive, but be aggressive with it. What about you in your life? What about me in my life? How are we when it comes to sin in our life? Are we aggressive with dealing with it? Just deal with it. Don't, don't be afraid of it. Just hit it head on. We've got the weapons. We've got what we need. Don't be afraid of all the results of what will happen if I actually deal with it. Just deal with it. It'll get dealt with, and then we can move on. Uh, where there's difficulty, the Lord will be with us. And it'll help us through that. I challenge you with that tonight. Uh, allow the Lord to use this in your life so we don't get in our individuals' uh, lives, in our families, in our church, ever succumb to this uh, sin in the camp that just hampers us and bothers us uh, like Achan and causes destruction and causes us to fear when we should be able to be confident. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for this challenge from the life of Elisha. I thank you for his life, Lord. I pray you'd help us to be like him, faithful. Uh, faithful over the long haul and, it, and uh, not, not mattering what kind of ministry that we have, whether it is public or private, uh, whether it is visible or whether it is seemingly invisible for these years. Lord, help us to be faithful to you and uh, not to be concerned with those things, but to be concerned with your agenda for our lives. We thank you for the great many blessings that you give us and the blessings of uh, the spiritual armor and the spiritual weaponry that you've given us to defeat Satan and the flesh. I pray, Lord, that you, you to strengthen us in these things. Individually and as a church, Lord, we want to be those who are against sin. We want to be against the things of the world. We want to be wroth and angry and have revenge executed against the sins of our lives. Lord, help us to root these things out before you and with